We say a group is simple if it has no non-trivial proper normal subgroups. Recall that every group has at least two normal subgroups. Uh, the group itself is normal inside of itself, uh, but you also have the trivial group, uh, which is gonna be a normal subgroup. So these ones are guaranteed. But what if there was no other normal subgroups inside of G? That's what we mean by a simple group. And why do we call them simple groups? That when you get more and more into group theory, you start to realize that simple groups are essentially the atomic building blocks of every other group. That is, we can create larger groups by understanding uh, what the simple groups are. And again, that's that's conversations we can have in a more detailed setting here. But simple groups, again, really are the most fundamental of all types of groups. Every group can really be built up from the simple groups. And so there's been a great effort very recently in the in the history of abstract algebra to classify all finite simple groups. Uh, the bulk of this work uh, took place in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, for which the the families of finite simple groups were classified. Uh, this would include cyclic groups, alternating groups, the projective special linear groups, uh, there's the sporadic simple groups, there's simple groups of various Lie types. Uh, we, won't, we won't go into all of those here, but I just want you to be aware that, that classifying and identifying simple groups is a very important branch of modern day group theory. So in this video, I want to prove two things about simple groups. First, I want to consider what are the uh, abelian finite simple groups. It turns out that one's pretty easy. And then I'm going to give you an example of a non-abelian simple group, particularly the alternating group. That one will take a little bit more to develop. So suppose that G is an abelian group. Then we're going to prove that G is simple if and only if G is cyclic, uh, cyclic of prime order. So it's just two directions, right? So we'll assume that G is abelian in all cases, right? So let's first assume, uh, well, let me, let me first say the following, right? What we've learned previously about abelian groups is that to be a normal group, right, you want that the left and right cosets are the same. Or another way of saying it is that your, your subgroup is closed under conjugation. Well, in an abelian group, conjugation doesn't do anything, right? Because you have G, X, G inverse. Well, since it's commutative, uh, you just get G, G inverse X. This will just become X, right? Conjugation doesn't move anything around. In particular, left and right cosets are the same thing in every abelian group. So therefore, every, group, every subgroup of an abelian group is normal. And so the only way that an abelian group could be simple is if it has no proper non-trivial subgroups. That is the only subgroups are going to be the group itself and the trivial subgroup. So if G is simple and you have some element X inside of G, right? So it's a non-trivial group. So X is some non-identity element, right? Then take the cyclic subgroup generated by X. That would be a non-trivial group. Um, if it's simple, that would then force uh, it to be improper, that is, it's the whole group. So this shows that G would have to then be a cyclic group if it's abelian and simple. And in fact, by essentially the, well, since it's a cyclic group, we've seen previously that for every divisor, excuse me, for a cyclic group, every divisor of the order of the group produces a subgroup, right? This is true for cyclic groups. Every divisor gives you um, a subgroup, a unique subgroup up to that order. And as such, there can't none of these can exist, right? So the only divisors of the order of G would have to be one in itself, which would indicate that it's a prime number. Uh, of course, the other possibility is it's the trivial group itself, which technically would be the case. We're not going to consider the trivial group to be simple, much in the same reason why we don't consider one to be a prime number. Uh, it needs to be something non-trivial uh, to be in consideration here. If we want to think of the simple group as kind of like the primes of finite group theory. So I guess it's the first direction. An abelian simple group is going to be cyclic at prime order. If we go the other way around, right, um, if G has prime order, then it necessarily is going to be cyclic. And by Lagrange's theorem, it'll have no non-trivial proper subgroups for which in that situation, right, since it has no non-trivial proper subgroups, in particular, it has no non-trivial proper normal subgroups, and so therefore it's a simple group. So like I said, a very slick argument there that the that abelian groups are simple if and only if they're prime order, which, which implies that it would necessarily be a cyclic group of prime order. The study of simple non-abelian groups is much, much more difficult. Like I said, 
uh, it, it took decades for you know the best mathematicians in the field to be able to classify all of the non-abelian simple groups. And honestly, the the paper, if you count the, the pages of all the collective papers that worked on it, we're talking about hundreds, probably thousands of pages. Um, it's, it's, it's still a chore. Um, the time of this recording here in the year 2020, it's still a chore just to kind of condense, um, condense the proof of these thousands of papers down to be something that could be taught, you know, in a semester long class, right? Graduate course, of course. So what about a non-abelian simple group then? There is one that is within our grasp to provide. It turns out we already are aware of some, the alternating group, right? Um, a n. It turns out that when n is greater than or equal to five, then this is going to be a simple group. Uh, A4 is not simple uh, because A4 has as it a normal subgroup, the Klein 4 group, sits in there as a normal group. And then A3 technically is simple as well because it's actually isomorphic to Z3, which is a cyclic group of order 3. So it's an abelian one. It's not, it's, um, A3 is an abelian alternating group, so it's sort of an exception there. So it's like, wh why is A4 different? What's so special about 5? Why does it start working after 5? And so what I'm going to do is collect some lemmas right now to help us prepare for the proof that A5 and larger alternating groups are all simple non-abelian groups. So the first proposition here is actually, this is something true for all normal groups. It has nothing to do with the alternating group necessarily. But if you have a group G and it has a normal subgroup N, and then you have some other subgroup H, which may or may not be normal, make no assumptions there. Then if you take the intersection of N with H, this will be a normal subgroup of H. Uh, the intersection of subgroups is itself a subgroup, uh, but we're going to have to prove, uh, which we'll actually prove that statement in this proof if you weren't aware of that, but we'll also prove that N intersect H is closed under conjugation, making it a normal subgroup of H. So how do we first show that N intersect H is a subgroup of H, right? Well, subgroups need three things. It needs to contain the identity. Well, as N is a subgroup, it contains the identity. As H is a subgroup, it contains the identity. So the intersection... They both contain the identity, so the intersection has it. So the intersection contains the identity. Um, it needs to be closed under multiplication. So if we take two elements, G and H, inside of N intersect H, well, that means that G and H are contained inside of N, and since N is a subgroup, it'll be closed under the product, G times H. By similar reasoning, right, uh, G and H will be contained inside of H. Therefore, since it's a subgroup, it'll contain the product G times H. So the intersection will contain the product, so it's closed under multiplication. Um, same basic argument for inverses right here, that since N is a subgroup, it'll contain the inverse of every element in there. So if G is inside of N, then G inverse will be inside of N. Well, same thing for H, right? If H contains G, then it'll contain G inverse because it's a subgroup. And therefore, the intersection um, is con it will contain the inverse. And so this right there shows that the intersection of two subgroups is, in fact, a subgroup of G, right? And in particular, as the intersection is likewise a subset of H, this would show you that it intersect H is a subgroup of H as well. Okay, so again, that really just comes down to that subgroups are closed under the pro under the operations of multiplication, uh, the identity, and inverses, right? So intersections are really nice for closure principles, right? Because if this set is closed with the property and this set's closed with the property, then the intersection will have that as well. That's basically how we're going to show normality here using the operation of conjugation. Remember, we saw previously that a subgroup is normal in G if and only if it is closed under conjugation or written in a slightly different way. We get that for all G and G and for all N and N, we have that G and G inverse is inside of N. So normal subgroups are those closed under conjugation for which this conjugating element G could be any element inside of G. In particular, what if we restrict it to the attention that it is a it's the, the things from H, which of course is inside G, so that's perfectly legitimate here. So let's take an arbitrary element G, which, which lives inside of N intersect H, and take an arbitrary element of little of H living inside of H there. Well, since N is a normal subgroup, then we have the property that H, G, H inverse will belong to N. Normality implies it's closed under conjugation. So we get H, G, H inverses inside of N. Well, okay, but G, is in H because it's inside the intersection of N with H. 
And we also have that H belongs to H by assumption. So since H is a subgroup, um, the elements H, G, and H inverse are all inside of H, so their product is inside of H. So we get that H, G, H inverse is inside N intersect H. This then proves that H intersect H, N intersect H is a normal subgroup of H. All right, so let's get specific about the alternating group right here. So our first lemma is that if n is greater than or equal to 3, then a n is generated by the set of three cycles. So we've proven previously that the symmetric group s n, right, the s n is, is generated by the transpositions, the two cycles. And that's where the idea of like even permutations and odd permutations came from. Because every permutation can be written as a product, not necessarily a unique product, but it could be written as a product of transpositions. Transpositions don't exist in AN because those are odd permutations. And so we have to replace transpositions with three cycles. But for A3 in a larger, we can prove that A3 is generated by the three cycles. So that's a nice generating set. So AN, you know, since AN consists only of even permutation, it suffices to show that every pair of transpositions is a product of three cycles, right? Because every permutation in AN is a product of an even amount of transpositions. So, that's a, that, so those transpositions could come into pairs. There's the first two, then the next two, then the next two, then the next two, et cetera. And so when it comes to uh, transpositions, right, the nice thing is when you reverse their order, it's the same thing. So every transposition is its own inverse. So there's not a lot of combinations you get here when you talk about pairs of transpositions. There's three possibilities. There's the possibility that a, the, the letters in the first transposition are identical to the letters in the second transposition. It's the same thing. So like AB times AB is the identity. Um, okay, sure. Uh, the identity, you know, maybe it goes without saying, but if you're in A3, you could take one, two, three, and then times by its inverse, one, three, two. That'll give you the identity. So the identity um, is a product of three cycles. You could have your trans uh, your transpositions, your two cycles could have one letter in common, the other two are distinct. So something like AB times AC. Um, well, notice here that if you try to calculate this, A goes to C, um, C goes to A, which then goes to B, and then finally B goes to A. So the product of those two transpositions is in fact a three cycle, the three cycle ACB, okay? What if you have disjoint two cycles, so like AB and CD, and those letters don't overlap whatsoever. Well, turns out AB times CD is the product of three cycles here. So notice if you take the product ACB times ACD, you're going to see that A goes to C, C goes to B, great, and then B goes to A, that gives you a two cycle right there. And then if I look at C, C goes to D, and then D goes to A, and A goes to C, um, we see this going on right here. So the, the product of these two, three cycles does give us the two, two cycle. And so since every pair of transpositions is a product of three cycles uh, and elements of the alternating group, those even permutations are generated by pairs of two cycles, we see that the three cycles generate a n, as long as we have n greater than equal to three. But I thought you said greater than equal to five. Where's five coming to play? Well, that, that's our next lemma right here. So let n be greater than or equal to 5. Then we're going to see that all three cycles are conjugate in an. We proved previously that in the symmetric group, permutations are conjugates if and only if they have the same cycle type. So in particular in sn, uh, all three cycles are conjugates to each other. Now that's not true in general, right? In the alter Well, for the alternate group, I mean. Because in a4, for example... In A4, you actually have two different consciousness classes of three cycles. Like one, two, three uh, is one represents one class, and then the others are the inverses one, three, two. So these two inverses are not conjugates of each other. And it turns out it's because you don't have enough letters. If you have five letters, then we can actually force conjugation between all three cycles. That's what we're going to prove right now. So consider the two three cycles, A, B, C, and X, Y, and Z. Okay, inside of AN. And kind of like the previous proof, we're going to consider this, we're going to, we want to show that these things are conjugates. That's not the similar part. But the similar part is we want to consider the overlap between their letters. We have like ABC and X, Y, and Z. Um, do they share some of the letters or not, right? Well, the first case is what if they share all the same letters? What if like ABC as a set is the same thing as X, Y, and Z? Although the order doesn't necessarily have to, we don't know how they correspond, right? I'm not saying A equals X, B equals Y, C equals Z or anything like that. There's some correspondence, but we do see there's only two possibilities, right? X, Y, and Z is either equal to ABC or 
um, it's equal to ACB, all right? Now, in the first case, if they're equal, if X, Y, and Z is equal to ABC, then of course they're conjugates of each other because uh, they're equal. Uh, conjugation is equivalence relationship, so it's reflexive. In particular, if you take X, Y, Z and you conjugate by the identity, right, uh, then this will give you ABC because ABC is equal to X, Y, Z. All right, that's pretty simple. Uh, so that gives us, you know, this observation right here. What about the other one? What if X, Y, and Z, what if X, Y, Z is equal to A, C, B in that situation? Okay. So consider, consider that possibility is when we have N greater than five is a three cycle conjugate to its inverse. Now this is, this is the cool part, right? So if N is greater than or equal to five, take all the letters in play here, one, two, three, four, up to N, right? The three cycle only involves three of them, A, B, and C. So that means if we take away A, B, and C, there's at least, since, since N is greater than or equal to five, there's at least two letters not involved inside of the three cycle A, B, C, or A, C, B. Um, choose any two of them. It doesn't matter which two you do, but take at least, take two of them, we'll call them I and J. And consider the following product, BC times IJ times ABC times BCIJ inverse. Oh boy, all right, that's kind of an interesting calculation there. But let's let's actually run through the calculation. BC times IJ times ABC times, we're going to take the inverse there. So we're going to get IJ uh, and BC, which I really didn't need to turn the order around. It's its own inverse because it's a 2-2 two -two cycle. It's order two. Um, but go through the calculation here. Let's see what happens to A. So going through this, A will go to B, and then B goes to C. All right, so recording that down, we get that A goes to C. Now what happens to C? C goes to B, B goes back to C, and C goes to B. So we have that, B. Um, what happens to B here? B goes to C, C goes to A, and then, so therefore it wraps it up. So okay, yeah, we got, we have A, C, B going on here, but notice I and J, they're not actually involved with ABC here. So these things actually commute. So this thing is equal to BC times ABC times BC times IJ times IJ. So these things actually cancel out because they're inverses of each other. All right. And so, okay. So you see that the, the I and J basically didn't serve much of a purpose. Why do we include that? Well, ABC, if we conjugate it by BC, BC is an odd permutation. BC does not belong to AN, but aha, BC times IJ, that does belong to AN because that's an even permutation. Even though the IJ is only present so that we can say it's an even permutation. It's kind of a slick move there, but this trick doesn't work in A4, for example, because there's not enough letters to get these superfluous I's and J's involved in here. So ABC is conjugate to itself and it's conjugate to its inverse. That was the possibility we considered if ABC and the set ABC and the set XYZ um, coincided. Well, if they don't coincide, right? What if they're not equal to each other? Well, then it turns out that at least, you know, if, if these two sets are not equal to each other, one element doesn't belong to the other. So let's say like A doesn't belong to the set right here. So X, Y, and Z, none of those are equal to A. But that would only leave, you know, but there's only three elements in this set right here. That also would imply that since these sets both have size three, that one of the elements on the right-hand side wouldn't, wouldn't match up with A, B, or C. So let's say that's X, right? So with the loss of generality, we can say that A does, does not coincide with X, Y, and Z, and that X does not coincide with A, B, and Z, all right? So in particular, the three cycle ABC fixes A, because X, excuse me, a, ABC fixes the element X because it does not belong to A, B, and C. Um, and the, the three cycle X, Y, and Z fixes the element A because A does not belong amongst X, Y, and Z right there. Okay. So again, since we have N is greater than or equal to five, uh, if we take away the letters A, B, C, and X, right, because those are all distinct letters, then you can take at least one more element I because there's at least five and consider the following product. You have AXI times ABC times AXI inverse. Three cycles are even permutations, so this is a legitimate product to consider inside of AN or bigger, right? And what happens with the product here? It's right over here, AXI times ABC times IXA. So if we go through and see what happens here, what, what happens to X? X is gonna go to A, A goes to B, 
and that's it. So we're going to get that X goes to B. So then going through B goes to C, and there's no other C, so we're going to get C right here. Then we go back to it again. C goes to A, and then A goes to X. So that finishes off this three cycle. Um, what about A and I, right? A goes to I, but I goes to A, so A is fixed. And then I goes to X, which X goes to I, so I is fixed as well. So this does, in fact, give us the three cycle um, X, B, and C. So this shows us that ABC is conjugate to X, B, C. But it's like, but I want ABC to be conjugate to X, Y, Z. What happens there? Well, we're going to recurse on what we just did here. So notice that we got, what we, what we have so far is that we have that ABC is conjugate to X, B, C. So we basically switched the first letter. We switched from A to X. Where remember, X and A were these letters that didn't match up. So now reconsider what's going on right now. So consider the set XBC versus XYZ, okay? Do these sets disagree? If they do, repeat this process. So let's say that like B and Y are now um, the things that don't agree between the two sets. If that's the case, then you can basically conjugate and you can replace XBC with XYC, right? And then you check again, uh, do these things match up? If um, if they don't, like if C and Z don't agree with each other, then we can conjugate one more time and we get that X, Y, and Z right here. So since conjugation is an equivalence relationship, transitivity, um, we can just do a couple steps to get from A, B, C to X, Y, and Z. So that's a possibility if they never match up. But it could be at some point they match up, right? Um, what if the set X, B, C is equal to X, Y, Z? Well, that was the case we considered up here, right? Um, in which case then we can force conjugation there. And so whichever path one chooses, eventually this will terminate with ABC being a conjugate to X, Y, and Z. So all three cycles in AN are conjugates as long as N is greater than or equal to 5. So that shows a lot of significance on why 5. Why, why 5? You need to have enough space for three cycles to wiggle in terms of conjugation here. And then our last lemma, uh, let N be greater or equal to 5, right? And suppose we have a normal subgroup of AN. If this normal subgroup N contains a three cycle, then in fact, N is all of A N. And why is that? Well, normal subgroups are closed under conjugation. That's a fact of being a normal subgroup. By the previous lemma, we saw that all three cycles are conjugates to each other. So if N contains a three cycle, then it has all of the three cycles because they're all conjugates and normal subgroups are closed under conjugation. But by then the first lemma of this slide right here, if you have all the three cycles and you generate all of an and therefore n equals an for which then we see that for every normal subgroup of an it either is trivial um or if it contains a three cycle it's everything right so now now the thing is we have to prove is that every normal subgroup of an proper subgroup uh, uh, every non-trivial subgroup excuse me um, will contain a three cycle that's that's our plan of attack right here so we're going to first do this for a5 uh so Here's the proof. A5 is a simple group. Let N be a non-trivial normal subgroup of A5. So again, by the previous lemma, if N contains a three cycle, then we're done. Uh, because clearly, if you have a non-trivial subgroup, it contains something. If that contains a three cycle, then boom, it produces all of A5. And thus, it proves that A5 is a simple group because it doesn't have any non-trivial proper normal subgroups. So what are the possibilities, right? Well, in A5, there's only three types of uh, permutations that live inside of A5, right? Well, I mean, I guess there's the identity, but let's exclude that for a moment. Um, if you're a non-identity permutation, you're either a three cycle, you're a two, two cycle, or you're a five cycle. Those are the only options um, inside of A5. Now, so sigma, since it's non-trivial, there's gotta be something that's not the identity inside of N. Well, the first possibility is it's a three cycle, but like I said, if it contains a three cycle, you know, it's done, right? So, so let's not worry about that one. Um, the next one then would be is if we have a 2-2 two -two cycle. And so without the loss of generality, we can assume, you know, up to relabeling, these things are like 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You know, I'm very clever in my labeling there. But, you know, up to relabeling, it's, it's equivalent to something like that, right? So sigma is equal to the 2-2 two -two cycle, 1, 2, and 3, 4. Well, let's consider the element tau, which is 1, 2, and 3, 5, right? That's an element that belongs to A5. It's even. So consider the product tau, sigma, tau, inverse. 
So this would look like one, two, three, five. Uh, then sigma, remember, was one, two, three, and four. And then tau, since it's a two, two cycle, it's its own inverse, so you're just gonna get one, two, uh, three, five again. So we're taking the conjugate of this thing. And so let's see what happens. Um, if you take one, one goes to two, two goes to one, and so let's see, one goes to two, two goes to one, and then one goes to two, like so. That's going to give one goes to two. All right, let, let me erase my marks there. So we got one goes to two. So then you're going to see, honestly, I mean, if you look at this thing, you can commute things around. Let me say it that way. Uh, so, I mean, like you have a one, two, one, two, one, two. Those all, those can commute with each other. Two of them are going to cancel out, actually. And so you're going to end up with a one, two. Great. Then you're going to have this three, five, three, four, three, five. That can't commute with each other because there's an overlapping three. But you'll see that three goes to five. And then five goes to three. So three is actually fixed. So three is actually left alone. And then we're gonna see that probably four goes to five, right? So five goes to three, three goes to four. And so you're gonna see four, uh, four and five going on right here. So that's that's the conjugate tau sigma tau inverse. Now, since uh, since sigma, right, is, is that's our normal subgroup, right? If you conjugate by anything in the alternating group, you get back to N because uh, normal subgroups are closed under conjugation, right? And so th also what comes into play a lot are in this argument is going to be commutators, right? So let's consider let's consider right here the commutator tau sigma, which the, the commutator here is just going to look like tau sigma tau inverse, which we did a moment ago. It's this element. Then times that by sigma inverse. So let's finish up that argument here, that calculation, I should say, tau sigma. This is going to look like 1, 2, 4, 5, and then we're going to multiply that by sigma inverse, which is itself just sigma. So you get one, two, three, four. Again, the one twos actually are disjoint so that you can move them around. So they're actually going to cancel each other out. Um, and then you're left with four, five times three, four, which I want you to convince yourself you're going to get three goes to four, four goes to five. And then you're going to see that five goes to four and then four goes to three. So this is a three cycle. Okay, uh, this is the three cycle, three, five, four. And so therefore, the second case gets us a three cycle. So that normal subgroup is all of A5. Um, so the last possibility is what if we have a five cycle, let's say one, two, three, four, five. Um, so let's consider the commutator in this situation. So we're going to take tau sigma, right? So consider uh, this product. So tau, we're going to say is just be one, three, two. That belongs to the alternating group, right? Sigma is one, two, three, four, five. Then we're gonna get uh, tau inverse, which is one, two, three. And so taking the inverse, we're gonna get one, five, four, three, two, like so. And so let's see what happens here. Where does one go? One goes to five, five goes back to one, and then one goes to three. Uh, how about three? Three goes to two, two goes to three, Three goes to four, like so. Uh, we then get four goes to three, three goes to one, one goes to two, and then two goes back to one. So those all wrap around. So we get one, three, four. And then lastly, uh, I guess we should figure out what happens to two now. Two goes to one, one goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes back to two. So two is fixed. That also means that five will have to be fixed. So we see that this equals the three cycle, one, three, four. Uh, so which case then N contains a three cycle and therefore it is, by the previous lemma, it's gonna have to be um, all of A5. This, this proves that A5 is a simple group. For bigger, An, right? So that is N is greater than or equal to five. We're gonna proceed by induction where the A5 case we just did a moment ago is our base case. So for our induction hypothesis that if we, you know, we'll, we'll, let's say we've proven that A5 is simple up to uh, the number K. That is, we haven't proven K yet, but we've proven like 5, 6, 7, 8, all the way up to K minus 1. Let's suppose those are simple groups. We're going to induct upon that. Let N be a non-trivial normal subgroup of AK. And let sigma be some non-trivial element in here. Our same goal is the same. We want to use sigma to create a three cycle. If we can find a three cycle inside of N, then that means N is all of A, K. So suppose, first of all, there's two possibilities we're going to consider. Suppose that sigma has a fixed point. That is, there's some number, you know, 
a sigma i that equals i. Now up to relabeling of the numbers here, we can actually suppose that this fixed point is the last number k, right? Because again, up to relabeling doesn't make much of a difference. So because of that, because sigma fixes k, we can essentially identify sigma with a permutation on k minus one many letters. Okay, and so this is how the induction is going to get into play here. So a k minus one we know is simple by our inductive hypothesis right here. Uh, by a previous lemma we proved in this video, if you take a normal subgroup and you intersect it with a subgroup, this will be a normal subgroup of that group right there. Now, n minus a k minus one is a non-trivial group because n contains sigma, which is non-trivial, and sigma, right, sigma belongs to this intersection where sigma is not the identity. So this thing is non-trivial right here, but by the lemma, it's a subgroup of a k minus one, a normal subgroup, right? And so since a k minus one is simple by our inductive hypothesis, it must be that n minus a k minus one, and since it's a non-trivial, uh, since it's a non-trivial normal subgroup of a simple group, it's got to equal a k minus one. So that tells us that this normal subgroup n contains all of n a k minus one, but wait a second, this alternating group on k minus one letters, it contains a three cycle. So bada bing, bada boom, n contains a three cycle. And so n is all of a k. Great, uh, by, by a previous lemma right there. So if it has a fixed point, then it's gonna be the whole, it has to be, it has to be all of a k there. So now we're gonna suppose, right? Suppose sigma doesn't have any fixed points going on right there. So in that situation, in particular, that means there exist some letters i and j inside of our set x, right? Where x, remember, is one, two, skip a few, all the way up to n right here. And so we have to have that there's no fixed point. So these letters i and j, right? Sigma send i to j, and j is not equal to i. That's what that should say. Clearly, j equals itself. That would be ridiculous. So sigma i equals j, but j doesn't equal i. That's what we have right there. Now, let tau be a three cycle such that tau of i is equal to i, but tau of j is not equal to j. So tau will fix i, but it won't fix j. And this can happen, again, because we have at least five letters. And so consider the product of these things. So remember, sigma sends i to j, uh, but tau fixes i. So if you look at sigma tau of i, well, tau sends i to i, so this will give you sigma of i, but sigma of i will send you to j, right? But, uh, excuse me, sigma, sigma of i will send you to j, but j is not what tau of j does, right? And then sigma sends i to j, so we can, we can factor this here. So notice here what happens, sigma tau and sigma, uh, ta sigma tau and tau sigma do different things to the number i. Therefore, sigma tau is not the same permutation as tau sigma. Uh, these elements don't commute with each other. And so if we let alpha be their commutator, sigma tau, sigma inverse, tau inverse, this cannot be the identity, right? Because if it's the identity, then the two elements would commute with each other, which is not the case. That would violate this, uh, this statement right here. So, so alpha is some non-trivial permutation that measures the commutator of sigma and tau right here. Well, since n is a normal subgroup, and since sigma is inside of n, that implies that alpha is inside of n. Because after all, you take tau sigma inverse tau inverse, sigma inverse is inside of n because it's a subgroup, tau sigma inverse tau inverse is inside of n because it's a normal subgroup, it's closed under conjugation. And since, since tau sigma inverse tau inverse is in n, and so is sigma, their product will be in n, so hence their commutator will be in there. And so alpha, this commutator belongs to n, okay? Now look at, look at sigma tau sigma inverse for a moment though, right? So if you factor alpha in a different way, right? So we factor it as a sigma times tau sigma inverse tau inverse, but you could also factor alpha in the following way. It's sigma tau sigma inverse times tau inverse. All right, so sigma tau inverse, that's a conjugate of a three cycle um, in which case, as this is, a, this is a permutation, we'll have the same cycle structure. So since tau is a three cycle, sigma tau inverse must also be a three cycle. And since tau again was a three cycle, its inverse is also a three cycle. So when you look at this factorization of alpha, we see that it's a product of two three cycles. Now those, those three cycles could overlap um, in terms of their units. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, it depends. But worst case scenario, 
right? We have something like A, B, C times X, Y, and Z, which again, some of the letters between A, B, and C could overlap with the letters X, Y, and Z. Uh, I can't make much of a statement there at the moment, but worst case scenario, alpha involves at most six letters of the alphabet, in which case that tells us that alpha will fix K minus six letters, okay? So if K is greater than six, then alpha has a fixed element and we actually can revert back to the fact that, oh wait, if, al if you have a fixed element, then, you, then A will, uh, N will equal AK, right? Okay, so if, if K involves more than six letters, well, we don't necessarily know that, right? We, we've already taken care of five and now we're in an inductive hypothesis. We, this actually is a possibility we'll have to consider, but also, if there's any overlap between these elements right here, if there's any overlap, then in fact, we can improve this bound. If you know, if they just shared one letter in common, let's say like A equals X or something like that, then it turns out there's only five letters involved. So we get five minus, we, then we get uh, K minus five, and then we can improve this mark to be like, oh, as long as K is greater than five, which we already took care of five, so we know that's the case. So what I'm trying to say here is that if, if K is greater than five, or if A is a product of non-distinct three cycles, then, then that means alpha has a fixed point and the above argument applies. So there's only one remaining case we have to consider. So we have to consider the case where alpha is a product of disjoint three cycles in A6, um, and which without the loss of generality as we can up to relabel and we can assume alpha is just the, the three, three cycle, one, two, three, and four, five, six. Okay, so let's let's play around with the commutator between alpha and the three cycle two, three, four. We're gonna call that beta for a moment. So consider this uh, commutator. We're gonna take alpha times beta times alpha inverse times beta inverse. This is an element that lives inside of N, right? Alpha belongs to N. Here's a conjugate of alpha using elements from A6. So since normal subgroups are closed under conjugation, this will belong to N, the, product's closed, uh, the, the product will be inside of N as well. So notice how throughout this argument, we use the fact that normal subgroups are closed under conjugation so many times to you know, show why conjugates and commutators belong to this normal subgroup. So if we look at alpha, beta, alpha inverse, beta inverse, we're gonna end up with one, two, three times four, five, six. Then we times that by beta, which is two, three, four. We times that then by alpha inverse, that's gonna be one, three, two, and four, six, five. And then we times that by beta inverse, which is two, four, three. And so what happens in this calculation right here? So I claim this is gonna be the five cycle, one, two, three, four, five. So let's, let's see how that works out. So one goes to three, three goes to four, four goes to five. And so that gives us that one goes to five. Uh, then we're gonna get five goes to four, four goes to two, two goes to three. So far, so good. Uh, three goes to four, excuse me, three goes to two, two goes to one, one goes to two. And then next we're gonna get two goes to four, four goes to six, six goes to four, like so. And then four goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to three, and three goes to one. So that finishes off the cycle. And as we're in A6, then six necessarily has to be fixed. So that validates the argument we have right here. So we see that this five cycle, one, five, three, two, four, belongs to N right here. Now, this commutator alpha beta, right? It's a five cycle inside of A6. That means the element six itself is fixed by the element alpha beta. And so then the above argument applies. Basically what I'm saying is that there's always, in, in this normal subgroup N, there's always some element that will fix some point and that fixed point we can then argue uh, then the normal subgroup has to be all of AK. So in this last case, we see that N equals A6 and that considers every case. Therefore, N is equal to AK by induction. And this then proves to us that the alternating group when it has five or more letters, is always a simple group. There's no non-trivial proper normal subgroups in that group.